Good morning. It's me, Michael David Cobb Bowen, and this morning I want to talk about a couple things. And what I will talk about <clears throat> is about Wokies. And I will talk about race. But I'm going to ask a question of you, and perhaps even answer it well, that you probably haven't thought about. So let's start. But the first thing I want to talk about is the movie that won Best Picture this year, the Oscars. I believe it's everything, everywhere, all at once. Yeah, it wouldn't be everywhere, everything, all at once at the same time. That's not proper. But when you think about it, it's probably the most incoherent and bizarre plot of any movie that's hit the screen. There's no simplicity to it. There's no elegance to it. It's weird. It's quirky. It's about a dysfunctional family. It's about time travel. It's inscrutable. And oh, it's about an Asian family. Inscrutable Asians? Isn't that a racial stereotype? Yes, it is. But anybody who can tell me that movie makes sense, <laughs> yeah, you're lying. Now, what is it about race that stays the same? The stereotypes. Jews are greedy. Blacks are less intelligent and overly sexualized and violent. <clears throat> Whites are all boring normal. Mexicans are thieving and hardworking. And you know the rest. Irish are drunk. Why then? And here's the question. Not what is woke. But why is woke? The answer is why woke is because if you're going to explain race and you're going to construct race and you're going to reconstruct race and you're going to try to make it relevant to today, you're going to have to keep changing your concepts. And so what we're saying is times change. Something about reality changes. Therefore, the construction of race has to keep going or else it'll fall apart under its own gravity because race is a social construction. It's fake. It's false. It's not real. And so we have to adjust everyone's perceptions if our racial talk is to have meaning in today's world. Why would you talk about the Africans as slaves when there's no longer slavery? Okay, well, then you can call them freedmen, which means they have their own set of problems. And then maybe they get integrated into society a little bit more, and you can call them coloreds. But you still keep them separate. And you still keep the same happy, darky stereotypes. And then at some point, some of them go to college. I guess we have to call them Negroes now. And then they have civil rights. So we might call them citizens. And we have an amendment of the Constitution to make sure that they stay citizens. And then they have a black consciousness movement and a black arts movement and a black power movement. I guess they're black now. But then we want to talk about all of them throughout history 
So we'll have to call them African Americans. They're Americans of African descent because the racial part, you have to keep up with that. Oh, but wait, there's folks from the Caribbean here and from actual Africa, so we'll have to call them ADOS, African descendants of slavery. There we go. Oh, but wait, we have to keep them separate from white, so we have to get rid of the national origin there and call them BIPOC, Black Indigenous People of Color. Racial definitions change because the people who keep stabbing at getting some meaning out of race have to change their definitions. That is why woke. Now, I'm an advocate of what I call personal deracination, which means to take all that racial stuff, which you inherit by virtue of coming into America or being an American, because America sustains ideas about race and theories about race and stereotypes about race and categories of race. And I say, get rid of it. Don't use it. Don't give it any weight. Think about things that actually make you a human being. Your virtues, your vices, your personality, your skills, your knowledge, your family, your relations, your religion. Anything but race. That's what I want you to do. If you just take one thing away from this today, that is to understand that your race is not you. And this was easy for me to understand because I grew up during a time when the Negroes were transitioning, unhappy with their old racial definition, to blacks. And they wanted to be black to liberate themselves from the Negroes that everybody knew. <clears throat> My father was a part of that movement. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you something wonderful. But I'm probably going to have to stop the tape so that I can find it. So I have in my possession the first edition of the first publication of a guy named Stanley Crouch and uh, Quincy Troop. It is the first publication by the Watts Poets from 1968. And it includes essays and poetry from the following folks, some of whose names might sound familiar to you. <clears throat> Quincy Troop, Ojenke, Ridiana, Elaine Brown, Robert Bowen, Stanley Crouch. I had something of an advantage being the seven-year-old son of 32-year-old Robert Bowen when he wrote his poem, Y'all Forget, which occupies about the last five or six pages of this first edition of the Watts Poets. And that was that I was part of this movement to go beyond Negro to Black. Now, this reformulation of identity was important in that I came to understand it, ultimately, as an intellectual creation. Now, not all intellectual creations are useful or good. And the ideas that bring such ideas, uh, the realities that bring such ideas into fruition through the work of scholars and writers and poets, they change. And if you are attempting to raise a race, which is a mighty large thing to do socially, 
then you're going to have to appeal to those people on a mass scale and change their mind. And certainly the Watts poets had that capability and they were a part of American history. Don't know how much this is worth, but it's very significant at the time. But I understood that if I could go from Negro to Black, if I could go from Christmas to Kwanzaa, if I could go from short pants to a dashiki, a lot of things in my life could change. And one of the things I ultimately realized is that lots of people, lots of Americans pre preferred to remain Negroes. And that would be specifically a lot of Christians. And they were a particular kind of Christian American. And some even changed, decided, well, if I'm going to be black, I can't be Christian. And so the Nation of Islam was born as well. <clears throat> Message to the black man by Elijah Muhammad, or the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, was one of the biggest books of the time. It's still out there. Malcolm X speaks. But race changes, doesn't it? It changes because we can't get a grip on it. Because it is a figment of our imagination, which is not real. And so we have to keep explaining it and keep revising our explanations. And the world came around to these young people and said, well, what they say about black, that's what we're going to make real in our society. So the answer is still not what, but the question is why? Why do people invest in race? Well, they invest in a set of abstracts that give their lives meaning. The question then becomes, well, what if those abstracts and meanings are not entirely correct? What if you go outside the boundaries of what that concept was originally meant for you to believe? Well, then you become an apostate of some sort. <clears throat> and I'm saying, for all of you, race is not what you, what you are. It's not who you are. And if you can't think your way outside of a racial box, then you're trapped. You are trapped by ideology. You are trapped by axioms of faith. And your mobility will be restricted and restrained. Because of all the people that were in this book, only several of them became famous. Stanley Crouch, Elaine Brown, Quincy Troop. My father's not so famous. He had a family to raise. He had other things that he could do with his life instead of dedicate it towards the construction and maintenance of an identity of a political ideology of race. So I participated from the thing that was supposed to liberate me from being a Negro, but now I find reason to be liberated from that thing called black. <clears throat> and you should probably want to do that as well. Because black, black is black is not an axiom of truth anymore. Because now there's 46 million African Americans and they're all different. That is why I do my work with the, the Foundation for Free Black Thought. To emphasize and, and put an asterisk around this thing called black diversity. Which is to realize that of all those people, they can't all adhere to the same everything, all the time, everywhere, all at once. I guess that at the end of the day, we'll all be somewhat inscrutable. We'll be human. We'll be able to see and recognize, oh yeah, those are human beings up on that screen. Those are human beings walking down the street. But they must be individuals somehow because they're not fitting into our racial paradigm. They're not adhering to these 
racial stereotypes or archetypes, what will we do with those people? Well, <clears throat> in closing, I will say that about 30 years after, no, well, 20 years after, 1968, when the Watts Poets did that, I came across something called multiculturalism. And for my generation, the black culture that we wanted to make the world understand, because we were loudmouth and we were aggressive about it, we said, well, you know, maybe integration is not a good thing. Maybe the melting pot is not a good thing. Maybe we want you to recognize black culture. Not necessarily the black experience, but a number of ones that we've selected. Spike Lee, Public Enemy, New Jack Swing. And uh, I had fun during that period because I lived near the beach and through some parties where we had 100 black people out there playing volleyball. What? Beach volleyball? Black people? Wait a minute. So I understood that black unity was not going to happen because black people, so the, the race of black people is too diverse within itself. <clears throat> and that diversity has increased. So I know it can't be the same thing. And yeah, I have to say, and I have to evangelize that idea that there is no single black community, that race is a fiction that must be constructed and reconstructed and deconstructed and then reassembled with the same Lego blocks that never get down to the atomicity of an individual in the flow of current in society. So, those are the best words I can come up with spontaneously. What woke is, what woke is, is it's something new. Because it's just saying everything that came before us is out of sync with the reality that we perceive today. And so anybody who says their hero is Malcolm X or Medgar Evers or Martin Luther King, they're old, they're passe, that's another generation, they don't understand what we understand. <laughs> ah, yeah, that's kind of arrogant, isn't it? <clears throat> so if you want to take their formulations of race, then you go ahead. But I'm saying take off those clothes. Be naked. Be free. This is Michael David Cobb Bowen. Thanks for having tea with me.